Hey there, Sterile Processing Universe. It's Hank Balch here from Beyond Clean. You're watching Workers or Widgets, a symposium on sterile processing, automation, and robotics. And I'm excited to talk today uh, to Yesh Pulijala from uh, Scalpel. And we're going to be talking today about a lot of these applications, not only for the sterile processing side of things, but applications for automation, machine learning, AI, also in the operating room suite, and how all the solutions, innovations kind of connect to each other. So, Yesh, thank you for taking out some time in your day to talk to us. Thank you, Hank. It's a pleasure. So, for folks who don't know you personally, give us a little background on uh, who you are and how you got into this uh, exciting corner of the healthcare universe. Sure. Uh, my name is Yesh. I am the co-founder and CEO of Scalpel. Uh, Scalpel is a medtech company. We're based in London. Um, we've been around for the last four years. We work quite closely with a lot of NHS hospital trusts. Um, and today we are working with sterilization units as well. We focus quite significantly on improving patient safety in surgery. Uh, and all of this have started many years back as I was doing my master's and PhD in medical visualization here in the UK. Um, as a part of my journey, I've attended thousands of operations uh, in terms of recording these procedures to, to prepare um, mixed reality-based training tools for surgeons. Um, so that was my initial introduction to technology and surgery. Um, I was trained as a dentist, so I come from a place where, you know, which values sterile processing really highly. Um, mm. whereas, as a dentist, we, we used to, you know, go through these ourselves as well. Um, but the biggest, I think the turning point happened uh, during my PhD when I was in an, op is in an operating theater. Um, everything started off all good. But halfway into the operation, we realized that the processes in the operating theater is not for the patient on the table, but for the patient in the next room. Um, the surgeon was trying to like fix the processes in the patient's mouth and it was flipping out. Um, mm. Uh, and I was standing next to the surgeon, could actually feel the heat come out of his body, like oh, what's wow. actually happening here. Um, and turns out that incidents like this, I went back home that day and I, I browsed the internet and found that uh, medical errors are the third leading cause of death. Uh, majority of them happen inside operating theaters. Nearly 50% of these errors are avoidable. Wow. Um, and the processes we have today to avoid these kind of preventable errors are still quite manual. Uh, we depend a lot on multiple clinicians checking uh, that we have the right equipment, right person, right patient, every single thing, uh, that we are operating on the right side of surgery on a paper checklist. Um, in fact, the checklist itself was adopted only uh, you know, 10 to 15, 11 years back, I believe. So right. it's, it's not super uh, long. So you know, we're just hoping that people do the right things to us inside a really high stake environment. So that's where we started off, um, you know, that this is a complex process and mm, different people come together. There is a lot of equipment issue that comes together. Um, and that's how we got involved ourselves with Scalpel. So what Scalpel does today is we, uh, we provide a data-driven platform that makes surgery safer across the surgical care pathway. Um, one of the significant parts that we focus on is surgical inventory management. Uh, so to ensure that you have the right of uh, right instrument at the right time, right place. Yeah, so we're going to be talking about a lot of data during this interview, I'm sure. But you brought up a couple of things that kind of bring back some memories for me. I remember as a young sterile service manager, um, I just taken over the department. I had a lot of things that I wanted to change because as a technician, I saw the challenges in our department and I felt like there was maybe better ways to approach some of those. And I stumbled upon a book by a, a doctor named Atul Gawande uh, who wrote a book called The Checklist Manifesto. And it blew my mind. And I know, I, you know, you kind of reference the paper checklist as kind of the old way of doing things, even though they're still fairly new, you know, but they're still problematic. But yeah, even the idea of a checklist in general, it is still fairly new to healthcare, to your point. Um, and again, from the sterile processing perspective, I was so shocked because um, I had been trying to get away from paperwork, get away from the steps, you know, because 
uh, I felt like the steps were slowing us down and that it, it, it was causing more issues than it was good. But through that book, I was convinced in the value of a standardized checklist or you know process, I guess, it would guide a user to our clinical worker like our technicians um, through a verified, validated process that would ensure that nothing gets missed. And I'm going to liken that now to another story that you reminded me of, which was my first procedure that I ever saw in the surgical setting. And it, and it just so happened to be a, a robotic prostatectomy. Um, and it was one of the first times that this surgeon had used the Da Vinci robot. And I was sitting in there, you know, brand new technician, new to healthcare, never seen a surgery. And I'm seeing the surgeon work in the robot. And then there's another, another physician kind of over his, so his shoulder saying, Oh yeah, you know, do this. No, 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 go that. No, 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 don't cut that. Um, and then you could tell the procedure was not going the direction that it was supposed to go and that the surgeon running the robot was not as skilled as I think anybody would have hoped that he would have been. And there was a lot of bleeding. There's a lot of repair going on in the midst of it. What really struck me was the phone call at the end of the procedure because the surgeon looked over to the nurse and said, you know, call his wife and tell him everything went well. <laughs> And I'm thinking like, oh, no, it didn't. It, it, it may have ended well, but the process itself did not go well. And I really struck then, you know, by your description of uh, of the number of errors, uh, specifically in the operating room suite, and, and that complexity uh, tied in my scenario, you know, to training, but as you mentioned, a lot of this is just the patient specific information that can get crossed or like the operative site or the site, et cetera. Um, is that, why is it not discussed more in the public setting or in the healthcare setting? And it is today, if it's such a dramatic issue as you've described, like I feel like it's still not as out there as such a um, challenge should be. But do you have any insight on why? Uh, I think it is well discussed today compared to a few years ago. Um, mm. And that is the reason, you know, we're, we're making this podcast. So, True. Or, yeah. or this interview. <laughs> so there, there are people who are thinking in these lines. Um, and even from a healthcare point of view, there are a bunch of whistleblowers uh, who came up and who, 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 who spoke up that, you know, these things shouldn't happen and they are happening inside operating theaters, um, you know, to, to make uh, the current processes more safer and more efficient. So that it is, it is discussed. It's, um, I wouldn't say that it, like no one is speaking about it, um, but I would look at it a bit differently in terms of what as a society do we expect from our healthcare practitioners? Um, so we just need to take a step back. So what happens is we go to medical schools. We are trained what to do and we are trained how to solve a particular case. And you're never prepared to for failure. So you're never taught, okay, something goes wrong or you know something you made you you made a mess here so how are you going to fix it that's never taught so what's mm -hmm. often taught is how to do things correct in the right way right so when you don't look at the wrong ways and they they happen inside the real world you don't know how to tackle them and that's mm -hmm. i think in those places these things like checklist or a structured thought process really helps because now you know that's what happens in airlines right so even yeah, from the exactly training, what i was thinking <laughs> yeah so even during the training they like on a simulator like you, you intentionally make a mistake so they they create simulations so you make a mistake and then they are supposed to open this checklist and read these steps out so they know okay this is how we are going to manage this situation there's nothing like that that happens a lot in healthcare it does happen but it happens on an individual one-to-one -one level like almost like a mentor because an expert surgeon could tell to his trainee you know what there could be a potential error here you need to solve it this way but it doesn't happen like on a standard curriculum level so that's there's that one problem is the second thing, which is when people report an incident and oftentimes they are blamed for it, you're punished for reporting, you're punished for speaking up. 
then obviously the next time you don't want to report it you would rather keep quiet and say as if nothing happened mm. so in the case that i was inside the operating theater and they had a wrong processes that is called as a near miss in medical terms if they would have fixed that processes in the patient mouth it would have become a never event an event that should not have happened right but even near misses are to be reported and um, that is where accountability kicks in but why would people be accountable if you are punishing them for reporting an incident so there is right. literally no transparency about what is actually happening and what is being shown to the world on top of that there is a third level which is i was uh, you know at once upon a time i was in a medical school um, and i was speaking to this really high you know uh, experienced professor i was saying can we record this procedure so we can share this knowledge to somebody else he was not okay with it because he was like okay what if somebody picks up something wrong in my procedure and blows it up across the internet um, okay this professor is doing blah 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 so there is a fear of being observed and again punished slash you know fear of failure that's typical cognitive uh, fears that come in um, i think those are the biases those that kind of drive most of this and now add a layer of hierarchy which is the surgical world itself is a hierarchical world like there are junior surgeons there are residents there are nurses there are surgeons and there are expert surgeons so consultants so right. obviously it's a complex environment so we cannot solve all the problems on day one but you know even bringing them to light is the first step so obviously there are there are some some ways we can we can address them and i think that's where i think tech plays a huge role um not in terms of uh i think removing the human aspect out of uh notifying somebody that something is going wrong i think that's that's tremendous and that's what uh, tech is capable of doing really so you um you mentioned the uh the lack of incentive to report errors or you know that concern around errors being exposed as you shared with the story about the surgeon not wanting his uh, his procedure recorded and yet you're working with technology that captures all those data points. Uh, how do you overcome those concerns when kind of your solution is, yeah, you know, before you may have been able to hide the fact that you did this or that you didn't do this, you know, but now with these technologies, it's all going to be immediately documented. Like what's that conversation look like between you and the clinicians? It's a hard conversation. It's not easy with everybody. There are some clinicians who are, I, I would say this is a common challenge for not just us, but for most of the med tech companies that have any form of data recording inside these sensitive environments. So the first place that anybody would go to are uh, customers who who value their systems uh, to improve quality, safety, efficiency. So there are there is that bit, and then um, there are clinicians who really want to improve their performance based on you know their past performance. So. Uh, somebody who genuinely records their procedures, there are surgeons who do it themselves right, without right. any uh, incentive. Now, these are the people who anybody would go to. But for mass adoption, you need to really show the value of this um, with with data, data backing the value of it rather than um, just recording the procedure and showing them the outcome. Also, I think for a very long, uh, I mean, for a very uh, wide adoption, it requires even a policy change that you're not punishing people because you get you get a data point out of it. Um, so this doesn't happen. This is the reason why it won't be, you know, adopted or used across every part of the world. So I come from India. There are there are incidents in India today where if a doctor makes a mistake or if something goes wrong to the patient inside operating theater, the doctor is physically abused. Surgeon is physically abused. They they literally bash the surgeon out. Um, mm -hmm. Now. In a world like that, obviously, you cannot come out and say, you know what, I made a mistake. I left a scalpel in the patient's body. Or nobody leaves a scalpel, but, you know, <laughs> I, I left a, uh, a tiny piece in the patient's body or a swab was left behind. Mm. It was my fault. Uh, I'm so sorry. Can we fix this right now? It's really hard to say that because now they will, they can, you know, they, they, they're going to punish you for it. Mm. So I think that has to change. Um, and when that changes, I think there is a high chance pe more people would come up. Also, what is let's let's look at it another way. Like, imagine somebody tells that there was uh, that they made a mistake. Are we 
supporting them in any way. So there is a huge uh, problem around second victim effect. So most mm -hmm. of these technicians, so either sterile service division or clinicians, they are putting them out there. They are underpaid. Okay, mm -hmm. they are stressed, and they are they are doing it for their own passion, not because of any other reason, right? So they when they're doing that and they make a mistake, are you supporting them in any way? Because there is a there is a problem called second victim effect, where it's not just the patient who is affected; it's also the technician, it's also the surgeon who gets affected because mm -hmm. they made that mistake, right? So what kind of support systems do we have for people like that? Rather, mm -hmm. we are punishing them, right? So right. Uh, so there are, there are. Uh, quite a bit of things there that makes it, that can make a difference here. So we've been talking broadly about data, but I want to speak, um, like, you know, maybe you can start from the surgical angle on like the kinds of data that we're talking about that are being captured or that, or that can add value to this conversation and then bring it down into sterile services. Like what are those uh, data points that if we if we knew them or could capture them or could leverage them could really start to improve our processes i think the the data could be looked at it in two ways so based on the stage of surgery um which is intraoperative uh, and anything that happens outside the operating theater right so if you look at it in that point of view anything that happens intraoperatively is is of massive value for the actual process inside the operating theater. So for example, you could measure how much time people take to set up an operating theater um, and you could measure the flow of the staff. So you know how much time should take in terms of scheduling the cases, because oftentimes what we have is we have double bookings. We have, uh, you know, multiple people booked at the same time or even next, you know, next to each other without mm -hmm. any understanding of how much time it's actually taking inside a procedure. So, right. you know, basically leading to cancellations or postponements of cases that leads to other things, you know, they are all connected. That's one aspect of it. Then there, there is another aspect, which is the actual procedural aspect to it. So in terms of procedural aspect, we're actually looking at, okay, what did surgeon A do? What did surgeon B do? Why did they go in this route? So it's almost like mapping the whole procedure. There are a few companies who have successfully done this in the past in terms of training staff members. Um, there are a few companies that are doing today um, some of this work, which is essentially analyzing what's actually happening in the actual procedure. Um, and then there is the process around it. So the process is the third part where, okay, it's not just about the surgeon and his assistant making the cuts, but it's it's a whole thing around who who brings the patients in, who uh, who carries them out, where is the porter, where are the surgical instruments, do we have all the necessary instruments, or are, are, are they all clean, uh, are they all functional, um, who takes these instruments back, how do you ensure that you have the right instruments at the right time, all right, is the anesthetist machine working all right, what happens if something goes wrong with the power supply, or so there are a bunch of other things which are to do with the process in itself that make or break the surgical case. So in terms of the data points, you can you can go out and collect any number of them, but hospitals already have this data, trust me. They already collect the data points. So some people, I would, I would like, even if you look at the top tier, like top 10% of hospitals who do it, they are very conscious of every minute that goes into operating theater. It costs them hundreds of uh, pounds, right. right? So it's not that they don't collect the data points. It's It's about, using those insights from the data that's to make the process safer and more efficient i think that's where uh, that's where innovation has to happen that's what that's where scalpel makes a difference which is yeah obviously there is a point of uh, streamlining the data to make any kind of insight but more importantly it's about understanding what is the end use that you uh, like uh, what is the end result that you need and then taking the steps in that direction um, i think that's that's the most important thing otherwise yeah, we have a huge amount of data. So when you turn your um, sites then to sterile services, like you described, you know, that operating room data capture there. Do we have the same amount of data in sterile services? Is it clean data? Uh, and whatever your answer is, is to that question, what could we be doing with the data if it was uh, packaged or given back to us in a usable manner? So there are there are a few things. So answer first answer is no. Uh, we didn't find that level of detail in the sterile processing divisions. 
but there are companies who who do this really really well we did find some companies that lead, that take the, that, that are leaders in this area who who manage their data points really well they kind of already know um how frequently these trays appear in their site uh, where is this instrument almost pinpointing it that's where i think we go into this whole tracking business track and trace so there are a bunch of software out there like i don't know i don't need to name them but you know mm-hmm. there are a bunch of track and trace software um, that companies use sterile service divisions internally use their own you know kind of platforms to manage it so there is some kind of data point it's i wouldn't say that they don't have any kind of data they have some kind of data but is that connected to what is actually happening in theater is that connected to what they, where they want to see this in terms of improvements is is a question that i i think the answer is no um the start of any of this has to be what is your end goal and we've been asking this again and again to a lot of our customers and everybody from the sterile service technician to the top consultant surgeon say one thing is their goal with it, which is patient safety improving the efficiency improving the process right that is what they say but what they do is a bit different which is <laughs> what they do don't they don't necessarily are provide they are not provided with the system that supports these goals right so okay patient safety so as a sterile service technician how do you ensure that your work is now making that surgery safer right so the way they do it today is they check for cleanliness functionality count of equipment and other things but they make mistakes and what is the process in monitoring that so again these things are quite connected hank which is obviously if you make a if you mess up a tray in terms of its if you place a wrong instrument in it or if you don't send instruments that are sterile into an operating theater obviously they can't use it the patient is either canceled or you know there is a surgical site infection that could be tracked back to this tray and you know it's a whole mess right um so it's important to first define your goals and create processes what we found so far in our understanding in our experience is data is in pockets people work in their own silos they don't see this whole picture in total uh, and even within an organization the top tier and the uh, frontline technician they share different insights about the same data points and that's really interesting for us hmm. i know we're jumping around a little bit here you know but you're making me think about different connections so um in this symposium, we've used a lot of the terms and I've had, you know, different people give kind of their perspective on what they mean when they say certain words. But I'd like you to kind of uh, tie some of these concepts together, because I feel like especially from sterile services, a lot of these concepts are completely new to us. Uh, we may have heard of machine vision out there, t- t- machine learning or artificial intelligence. Um, can you tie in like what? what those concepts are from a high level and then also tie in like how are they applicable not only to data and you know taking action on data uh, but also for uh, driving automation in the space and and then potentially tying that you know to robotics because not all automation involves robotics obviously no so so there are a bunch of things out there i think the most important thing to realize is um so robotics is one way automation can happen it's not the only way um so there is a software level automation that can happen so for example you for example every time you find a tray which is having a wrong instrument you might want to print a sticker that says um this tray doesn't have sorry every time you find a tray with incomplete instruments um, right. or incomplete trays you might want to print a sticker that says these 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 instruments are missing out of this right. right so you can either have a human do this by clicking a bunch of buttons or you can have a computer vision system or a machine drive that for you which is every time it looks at a tray one instrument is missing automatically prints a sticker put it on the tray and send it out now right. that software path is an automated me- uh, mechanism you don't okay. you don't have to you know do it by clicking so that's that's the way automation is the right word for it so where you take a regular task and you find ways to make it faster using a system um that's where automation comes in artificial intelligence is like this really large term that encompasses a bunch of things 
there is a general artificial intelligence, but that we're we not talking about that. I think, I think specifically with respect to machine learning and the use of, for example, the words like machine vision. Machine vision is another computer vision where the cameras. So there are cameras that look at the process and capture the data in the form of, uh, you know, images. But then on top of those images, we build AI models, artificial intelligence, machine learning models, or deep learning models that do something with those images. So either they are detecting patterns, they are detecting uh, objects, they are detecting events. I don't know what whatever is the interest of the end user. You mm -hmm. you build an AI model that does something on it, and these machine vision cameras these these are uh, capable of sometimes running those AI models in real time or sometimes send them to cloud. So it's very similar to like for example, you click a picture of your friend and yourself uh, on your phone, and you upload it on Facebook, and Facebook <laughs> tells you. Facebook or Instagram tells you, are these, is this this person? <laughs> yeah. yeah, is this this person? And so that's that's face recognition working there, mm. um, and that's how you say, oh yeah, this is this person or not. Mm. So that's a very simple way to look at things. That's how uh, you know most of these machine vision systems work. Uh, so robotics, you mentioned robotics. So robot is like literally a, a third member there in in the area so it's not just you it's not just these cameras but there is this physical object um that sometimes has a robotic arm that kind of picks up and does certain tasks hmm. so automation doesn't necessarily mean replacement of human automation could be collaboration where you know you are you're tired whole night you're working and and then you have this 20 clicks to make to get to this one task done, you can automate it by building a piece of software where you st you're still doing this task, but you do it quite efficiently. So you're mm -hmm. not wasting time. You're getting it right. You're getting it checked. Stuff around that. Right. Does it help? Yeah, no, yeah, that's fantastic. And it, it leads me right in to, you know, maybe more of a sales conversation, but also kind of an adoption conversation because these concepts are so new, are not new, maybe, but so misunderstood <laughs> in the healthcare space. I'm curious how much of your time is spent just explaining the impact of these things to these healthcare providers, because it's not like everyone knows. And so you're just like, hey, do you want to use my service or my widget? It's you got to start at the ground floor for a lot of these conversations and build all the way up to where now they understand, okay, this is what's possible. This is the impact. And then in from there, you can start having questions around pricing and cost and ROI. Am I hitting that on the head there or does the conversation take a completely different uh, tra trajectory? Like how, how's that kind of going, I guess? In your experience so again i think it, it's it's both the ways it's not this or that it okay. depends on the customer there are there are hospitals today there are sterile service divisions today who understand a lot of these things by themselves mm -hmm. that percentage if you consider it as like 10 10 to 15 percent that is already really high for early adopters right so there is always this graph that says early right. adopters innovators laggards you know you know mid-level who understand it not so much and stuff um a lot of it is really dependent on evidence and you know technology fails and that is the reason people are like really reluctant to try these or you know a lot of people know about cryptocurrency but they, they're really scared about it because we think it's a sham or it's a scam whatever is happening with this world nfts and other things so mm -hmm. you know it, it feels quite uh, widgety and you don't really understand if that is something that you want to put your energies and time and effort on that is the fear with, with that comes with tech mm -hmm. i think the way we handle it is we start with the basic need. What is the need that you have on your site? What is the burning need? Oftentimes, this distills down to one of these three. Either they want to improve efficiency, or they want to improve safety, or they want to improve their quality. Everybody, these three things, everyone can improve, right? You can never be uh, more cautious in, in terms of making a process more safer. You can, always, you can always make it safer. You can always make it more efficient can always make the quality better, right? So if that is your interest, now the next thing that we do is we ask them, how do they do it today? 
right? So they say, okay, we have this process, whatever process is. Then we drill down, okay, what is the challenge with the process? Because it appears that you're saying these are the things, but look at the data points. You have you have these number of incidents or you have these number of wrong trace. How do you, how, why do you think these things are happening? And then they often point out to a person or like a, a, a reason somewhere saying, okay, because we don't have as many staff. So there is this staff shortage problem, all right? Mm. Right. Why is there a staff shortage problem? Because you're paying them low and the work is really intense and what, what's happening there? Or, or why are you not able to find the right candidate? So we we really drill these things down to understand what their core problem is. Um, that's how we've done with a lot of hospitals in the first few years. Um, but as I said, nobody uh, is willing to not try a platform or a system that makes their lives easier. That's that's the way I would look at it. But this is also pretty important, which is not just for us, but any other companies who are trying to develop technologies for healthcare. They need to work quite closely with the end users. So they, they're really short on time. They don't have any additional minute to spend on your fancy technology. Mm -hmm. um, and this is the reason I think we've tried a bunch of systems. We've tried iPads, we've tried Microsoft HoloLenses and you know a bunch of other tools. Um, in the initial days with all the you know uh, buzz going on but i think they don't have any time to spend to learn how to use this new platform and then be really happy that it is working they don't care i think what they care is getting the work done get home happily right, right. so if you're able to make that process easy for them in a way that they don't have to learn something new get the work done anyway but only make it even faster and efficient um sorry and safer then I think that that is a win-win. So that is how we also show the ROI to these uh, to these people. But the underlying thing is, whenever AI comes into the place, there are uh, now is not the case. I don't I don't find that often right now. But maybe it is an underlying fear that AI is going to replace human out of the equation and stuff around that. That uh, we don't fear those anymore, primarily because. I think more and more people are seeing AI, what its capability is, what it's not. Um, but we see it as a collaborative intelligence um, where it works with humans on a on a particular challenge, making the process more safer and more efficient. Well, and especially now with all the staffing shortages, um, there's not as much concern about taking my job because we don't have enough people <laughs> to do this job anyways. Um, so yeah, anything that could help make it more efficient, you know, would seem like a better solution today than just three You're years saying ago. that as a, you're saying that as a manager, for it, let's say, but mm -hmm. what about your technician? So your technician might feel that, okay, if that new system is able to manage uh, the absence of five of my friends, who mm -hmm. are my friends who are now not a part of this then mm -hmm. it can eventually replace me and i wouldn't be needed i, I don't know where to look for a job mm -hmm. so you know that might, some, for some people not for everybody but for some right. people that is the only thing they know whatever they're doing right. right so unless like i think also these systems you need to know what where they are really good at and where they are not so good at so there's this very interesting story it happened um a few years back when this Alpha Go, the chess um, oh, right. came in the yeah. first time. The, Gary Castro, the uh, grandmaster of chess, uh, he played alongside the uh, AI with uh, with a, a bunch of you know uh, other people, and there were two um, uh, amateur chess players along with a the robot. They actually won the game, and the 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 takeaway here is it's not about a plus B is, is more than C kind of thing. So it's not about the best in the game and the best AI means the best outcome. That's not how it works. It's about even the right kind of person, even an average person who knows how to use this AI for the best of their work or the task, they get the best outcome. So it's very important to know how to use this system rather than saying it works or it doesn't work, it replaces me or it doesn't. That's not the way I look at it. It's more like any vehicle you have, right? It it only makes your process faster, but only if you know how to drive it. <laughs> if you're messing with it, then obviously it takes you longer to go to right. your destination. So I, I, I would look at it that way. So think about it as an 
as a as your vehicle to get your tasks done quickly and sometimes it can do a part of your task and that's okay you you'll have more time at hand so you can relax i guess so i, I really like it, that example by the way because yeah that's a great application of how how technology is a tool and not not necessarily a, a replacement um and i'm curious you know we've talked to another a uh, clinician who has uh, come through as a surgical tech and as a sterile service manager, but we haven't talked to uh, a clinician such as yourself, you know, who has been on the, on the operative side of the table as well. Uh, how does that impact how you approach these opportunities in this technology in this space? Like, has it helped you have that conversation with other physicians? Does it give you maybe like a new perspective that folks just coming from the science side of it or even from the user side of it wouldn't have? Yeah, I think the, that was that, that's a very big impact actually because they don't look at me as a salesman mm -hmm. trying to sell them a piece of technology. Uh, and it's also, it helps me as well to put that hat on all, almost every single minute because uh, when we are building tools, as I, as I was saying, you don't want to make the current process a step more complicated than it is so mm -hmm. i know how it is how hard it is being on that front line and you know trying to do a bunch of things and now this new piece of gadget comes together and you know, right so <laughs> something else to, to do <laughs> yeah, something, yeah. one more thing to do so you you never want to uh, create one more thing to do in their current process so i think that's the uh, that's a very important takeaway um, but also i think it it really helps for me when they say anything for me to understand and take that in into development of the process um because i can drill down them specific questions saying okay what are the what are the challenges and i i can understand that so the, the communication is 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 the biggest thing uh, on mm -hmm. on both the sides when we try to convince them of the value of these systems um because they shouldn't feel like yeah i know you're talking about fancy tech but you don't know how our process is or how complicated our process is right. come into my site and see that they shouldn't feel that right but that is what happens with most of the tech guys when they try to sell something without understanding their uh, customer really well i understand my customers very well because i've worked mm -hmm. on uh, frontline front clinical area and also on the ssd side seeing the process now you mentioned earlier about the adoption curve for technology. And as you mentioned, that's a very common, well-known um, um, data point there. I'm curious because you're coming from um, m multiple international perspectives, like you're in the UK currently, but your background's in India, you're doing work in the US. So you've kind of got that global perspective. Is there a difference in that adoption curve uh, to different countries that you've been into? And if so, can you kind of give us any insight to where various folks are currently? Absolutely. I think um, out of all the conversations I've had, the U.S. customers are uh, encouraging it more than anybody else. Um, <laughs> and that is only because they have seen a lot of these technologies or a lot of the, the value of these tools in their current processes in some way or the other. Um, most of other countries are like literally catching up. Uh, UK is, is also pretty good because we have uh, one of the strongest AI networks here. Uh, so from a tech standpoint, from an R&D standpoint, we are really good. We are in fact supported by the government of the UK multiple times in our work. Um, there is a very strong focus on the use of uh, AI in improving the current processes. So there is a there is a good understanding of that mm. but mm, i think even for the for that matter you mentioned india so china india uh, there there there's a huge level of adoption right now in terms of ai so i wouldn't look at it more from a geographic point of view but i would look at it even within the us i i'm, I'm pretty sure that there are hospitals who never want to try anything close to you know uh, close to, close to these kind of things it is true with people, Hank. It doesn't matter where they come from. It's where they are right now. Uh, what are they? What are their fears? Uh, because it's most of the most of our actions are either driven by love or driven by fear, mm -hmm. and a majority of people do it based on their fears. Um, mm -hmm. So they must be either having an experience, which is terrible experience, trying this new electronic healthcare record system that or that led to some data breach, or they must have had this really 
interesting experience with their iPhone that make them consider, you know, can we try a similar technology? So end of the day, it's human, like personal level. But as a country level, I, I would look at it more from the wider community support. So US is great primarily because of, uh, for, for a startup, uh, the kind of support that that is present in the country is really high compared to you know any other country in the world. That is the reason US is where it is today. Um, but there are other countries which at, a, at an equal match, I would say. Right. I'm. Uh, I was waiting for you to to maybe bring up the generational divides as well because you mentioned mm -hmm. it is kind of more person dependent and it is geography. But if you drill down to the person, I would assume the younger generation of physicians. Yeah or to our clinical users that have grown up on technology such as the internet, smartphone, uh, all the facial recognition stuff that we've kind of been chatting about, that's just in our blood. You know, like we are yeah. not afraid of those because we have, like those things have raised us in some sense. Uh, are you seeing that or feeling that impact yet in healthcare? In Absolutely. Okay, so how do you navigate that? Because obviously in terms of hierarchy, uh, there's still a, a large percentage of those generations that that was not their experience. Um, are those different conversations? Or are they aligning the generation somehow, you know, through the data and the experience side? Do you have any insight on that? Yeah, I think the most important thing, Hank, is, uh, yeah, I think a, a lot of these young generation, uh, generational technicians slash clinicians, they, they're, Think about them as early adopters or initial adopters, but they don't form the majority of them, as you rightly pointed out. Uh, and the majority of them are not wrong. They're just asking for data points. So right. they just don't believe in you like right. the uh, younger ones want. So the younger ones are like willing to try on you, willing to bet on you, even though you don't have a proof. Whereas the uh, a mid longer term uh, you know, expertise person or like a, or an expert in the field, they're not trying to say you don't work. They're just saying, show me the proof that you that you are going to work. So um, really data can turn the key here. It's like, it's not just about telling people, convincing them that this is a fancy tech, but if you're able to demonstrate everybody, like for a sensible human being, they'll get it and they would see the entire industry is changing. So they will have to change. So it's not a context of, um, uh, would it happen or not? It's about when is it going to happen? So yes. if you are going to adapt with the tech, you you thrive. Otherwise, you would be uh, you know soon be replaced by your competitors in the, in the game. So right. that's not a question I would look at it. I think the way we are, and that's what most of the startups are doing today, which is we are trying to generate as much evidence as we can in various scenarios in different conditions, um, and everyone has a place in this because. You know, the younger generation must have not seen the challenges these other guys have seen in their life. So obviously we need to work with them to, to build a system that works in all the scenarios rather than just trying to be super trendy, but doesn't work. <laughs> right, so, right. So now we've just got a couple minutes left here. I wanna ask you real quick, what does the next five to 10 years look like in, in a surgical space and a sterile, in the sterile services space, what technology, in your opinion, is going to become kind of the common uh, thing that everybody's using in their department in 2031? So one of the first things that is going to happen moving from now to the next at least two to three years across the industry is, is a way that you document this this information. So the, the generation of data, standardizing the flow of data is going to happen first, because for any of these other systems to take over on that information, you first need a, you know, an ontology, a common language in terms of how the data flows. So that is going to happen first. And without that, if we try to do any like longer term adoption, so if you bring a robot and try to, you know, mess it up, it fails and you think, uh, oh, it doesn't work. It's not that way. It's about, as I told you, it's a vehicle. You can use it in the best way that you can. So now you have this power, how are you going to make use of it? So it's the first thing is creating the data architecture. So there are a bunch of these companies who are currently trying to build that. So we we also do that for SSDs and hospitals. So that's one thing. And on top of that, the second level is the uh, a journey together with machines, which is a collaborative intelligence that we see. Um, the way we look at it from there is 
automating tasks that are that doesn't require human uh, effort as much so yeah. tasks are um, such as for example manually checking every single patient at 25 times in their pathway to surgery you don't need to do that you can have a system do that for you you focus on the surgical care um trying to document every single thing that you have done on a paper you don't need to do that your cameras and microphones could do you focus on doing the task so they re- they create a report you check for the report and you sign it up saying that is correct or not um same thing with instruments so you know you cannot at, at this point in time you you are not thinking about replacing the human but there are a bunch of tasks they do today like i don't i know many of my uh, c- customers who have over 50 over 60 year old uh, uh, technicians sometimes who over, definitely over 40 to 50 years old technicians who lift these really heavy weights of these trays and day in day out they are doing this and it physically hurts them right. midnight to you know 2 o'clock in the morning they they're just doing this all the time so you don't need a human to do it you can you know let let a robot do that work for you and mm-hmm. you you focus on ensuring that you have the right instruments in front of you ensuring the quality is correct so so there are a bunch of things in this in this regard the way i would look at it is um adoption is going to increase significantly primarily post covid we have seen a lot of uh, medtech being adopted without a bunch of challenges like before there has to be uh, a rigorous validation of technologies as well it's not just about saying this fancy things were actually proving that it can do deliver so there would be new laws in terms of you know standards that technology like this you know can can go into these operating theaters or sterile service divisions validating that it works efficiently effectively um but then there is a significant amount of user adoption so that is where mm. you know training wise and also adoption wise there would be a change i would see and we we believe the future of surgery is safer is more efficient is greener so a lot less wastage so today we open trays there are 100 instruments we only use 30 right then the, what's happening to the other 70 they just never see the face of the patient they have washed repeatedly you know uh-huh. so right. we believe the future of surgery is greener so there would be technologies that make that process more uh, uh, optimized for you know specific procedures and it is data driven and definitely the future of surgery is data driven and we believe scalp will play a significant role in that future uh, through by providing this data driven surgical care improving you know the the current processes almost bringing collaborative intelligence to the current processes by combining an ai and a human intelligence together mm-hmm. that's where we see the value really is awesome well uh, for folks who want to continue the conversation with you maybe you sparked an idea or uh, a dream of theirs maybe they just want to give you some more feedback from the user side uh, what's the best way for them to track you down and contact you or also to find more out about scalpel So you can find more about Scalpel at www.scalpel.ai. You can reach out to me at yes at scalpel.ai, um, and I'm on LinkedIn, so that's the best place. Or you can email me. Um, so th- those are those are really the best places to reach out. Awesome. All right. Well, that was Yes. Thank you so much for your time today, uh, speaking to our audience and to the audience. Thank you for tuning in to this symposium. As a reminder, get your CE credit by clicking the link below and please tune in to the other sessions of the symposium. If you missed it, we have a lot of fun conversations on all kinds of different aspects around the industry related to machine learning, AI, automation and robotics. And until next time, keep fighting dirty.